The day after coming back from San Gimignano, we had a little bit of rest. Uh, we woke up a little later and made our way towards Santa Croce, which is a beautiful um, square church in the heart of Florence. And uh, today we're going to work on some street scenes, uh, putting people in our scenes. That's our main goal for today is to use Florence and specifically this street view as a motif and to show the, try to portray the crowds that are moving through the streets at all times in Florence. It's a very busy place. The energy is high and that's sort of what I'd like to portray. And I'm starting uh, this painting uh, with some of the light areas. This uh, light that's coming in from the left-hand side is the first stroke that I put into the painting. And into that, I'm creating figures. And this is a difficult um, part of any kind of painting is putting figures into your painting to make them look real, uh, animated, uh, the correct proportions as though they're moving forward or sideways and to get a feeling like they belong to the painting like they're not cut out and pasted into the painting uh, this is going to be um, these figures are going to be made more complex by the fact that we have a, a crowd scene and we have a variety of figures moving through the scene some figures are moving through the light that's uh, separating the streets Others are going to be in shadow, and I'm. You saw me painting a lot of torsos and heads, in a blocky fashion. Uh, this is going to be the crowd eventually. I'm painting the figures light, initially, so that I can cut around them with the darker washes that follow. And and then that those light figures are going to give me a backdrop to some darker figures that are coming closer to us. So there's a definite strategy in terms of layering these figures and achieving the feeling of a crowd. Uh, I've moved on now to a couple of the big washes. These big washes are the sides of buildings that create the narrow passageway. Very typical of Florence, a lot of sienna, a lot of ochre, even in the shadows, these buildings tend to glow because of the color of the stucco and because of the intensity of light that you feel uh, and when you're traveling in Tuscany and in, in the region. And so I'm starting with a lot of warm colors. This won't be the final aspect to the wash, but this is definitely sort of an underpainting that's going to give the following um, blues and grays uh, a glow to it and I'm doing this while it's wet I want to get a smooth transition a little bit of transition from a, a lighter aspect to a darker aspect uh, as it nears the figures and it's a graded wash in essence it's a graded wash which we use a lot in watercolor uh, this case it's being done wet on wet and I want to get a transition from warmer and lighter up on top to a little cooler and a little darker down below. This contrast of light and dark or warm and cool is what creates a sensation of light, of light bouncing through the, through the streetways that we see. As you can tell, it's still very wet and I'm still working it. I want to get it near finish before I let it dry and then I'll move on to the to the other side this is important when you're creating this sort of wash where you have smooth gradations to accomplish it as much as you can while it's wet starting this uh, near wall in the same manner uh, the left wall is a wall that tapers towards the distance. It's close on the left-hand side and it diminishes and gets smaller as it moves away from us. This wall that I'm painting now is facing us directly, so it has a little different combination of elements where I wanted to create a, a lighter area and a, on top and a darker area below on the left-hand side. I reverse that here and I'm going to be trying for a little darker 
up above, transitioning to a little bit lighter as it comes down. Again, this is a play of contrast, and um, this contrast is what excites us in painting and gives a, a feeling, helps to create the mood, actually. And I've also used those two big washes uh, of the walls to create the heads or the figures, uh, at least the profile of the figures that are moving through the painting. And if you notice, they tend to be on the same level. Uh, this is one thing that will help you with your figures. If you're doing figures and you're standing on level ground, um, you can place them at various points in the painting, near, far, mid-ground, uh, which is a good strategy. Um, but you can line the heads up. Uh, the, the part that will change is the length of the body. For example, that small figure that I'm painting now is in the distance, and it's much shorter. Uh, than the figures that are moving through the shadows that are close by. This helps to create depth in the painting and a feeling that you're standing on the same level with your subject. And we feel like we're moving through the crowd as a result of this type of placement. If we are looking down on the subject, um, as the figures move back into the painting, the figure will rise, they'll get smaller, and the head will rise in the painting also. Uh, the same is true if you're looking downhill. The figures will get lower and lower as they retreat in the painting. So these few things will help you in placement, helping you to place your figures. Um, as for getting them to look realistic, um, this requires basically, like everything else, just practice. And one exercise that I do a lot is just paint figures on a piece of scrap paper using a few strokes, um, starting with the torso, adding legs, adding arms, and I tend to add the head at the end of the painting uh, because this helps to give the body some feeling of direction. Like if it's moving towards us, like that figure which I just painted, the head is going to be a little more forward. If the um, figure is standing upright and examining something. The head is going to be towards the back. The head tends to give us a feeling of which direction the, the figure is moving. So I save that for the end for that reason. And uh, maybe you notice, maybe you don't, but the, the heads of my figures are just a little bit small. This makes them feel more like adults. A common uh, problem that I see with um, those who are just starting out with making figures is we tend to make the head a little too big. What this does is it it makes the figure look like a child. If we want to give a sensation that these are, you know, adults moving through a scene, um, go for a, a little bit of a smaller head than you think. You can always make it bigger. You can always adjust it. If you make it too large, well, you can make the body bigger, but it often ends up you're painting on a slippery slope and uh, the figure can quickly get out of proportion. And, and uh, this comes, this points out another interesting um, aspect, which is because we are people, um, we're very sensitive to body language, to proportion, much more so than anything else in nature. So. Uh, it's one reason that we feel, when we're starting, we feel so unhappy with our figures is because we're very sensitive to uh, how they should look, you know, the proper proportions, the, because we're people. We know what people look like. So it, it takes us much longer to get familiar and confident in using figures than it would, say, painting architecture or painting fruit or painting flowers, because we can make a mistake with uh, a pear, for example, and it's still going to look like a pear. It might not look like that specific pear, but it'll look like a pear. The, when we make a mistake with a figure, it really causes us some almost physical discomfort. We don't like to, to see that. And so it's a challenge. Figure, painting figures is a, definitely a challenge, and it will always be that way. It's one of the reasons that in the 
when you were apprenticed in the Renaissance time. We're in Michelangelo's city. Uh, he was apprenticed, and he the first thing I think when he was training every day was uh, studying plaster casts, marble statues, sometimes a live model to get a confidence with the figure, so that when he came to paint the Sistine Chapel, he had no true reference in front of him. He was painting from his, basically his knowledge of the figure and his memory of the figure. And he he had drawn it and painted it and sculpted it so many times that it became natural, very natural to put the body into any type of position with accuracy and confidence. And uh, that's why his works have such strength, such overwhelming strength. It's because he knew the figure so well. Well, our painting has progressed a little bit, hasn't it? We're putting in, I mean, we put in the distant tower. We put in a, a canopy and some rooftops to make these buildings come forward. You can see how the washes, the background washes have dried a bit lighter, uh, but we see those transitions that I was talking about. And now we liven up those washes by adding windows or doorways or balconies or signage. And this helps to create the perspective that we see. At the same time, it makes these shadows, and basically these buildings are in shadow, it makes these shadows look more transparent. So this is an important stage to, to paint these uh, strokes, which are basically creating the feeling of the windows that we see beautiful in their own right. It's, a, it's a, just an amazing city how much um, love and craftsmanship went into building Florence. Everywhere you look, the, the tiles that mark the streets are beautiful colors and have are painted well. The, the moldings uh, around the windows, the awnings, the and of course, the grand architecture of the basilicas and the churches is is just staggering. And so we've we've taken care of some of the details, and we'll go back to placing you know more more details in the figures. And that pathway of light that we started with, you can see, is becoming more and more powerful as we add more darks. And it's uh, highlighting the figures that we see moving through the light. This was what initially attracted me to the scene, was a passageway of light that figures were moving in and out of. I felt that helped in creating sort of this busy feel. Uh, it helped to describe the time of day, the sort of richness of light that we, we've been experiencing in our trip to uh, Florence. And so that's what caught my eye. And Obviously, these vi figures didn't pose for me. I'm taking them basically out of my head. There's no photographic reference. I've composed them as I think they will work well. Uh, the distant figures are less, descrip less described. I have a family, if you can see, moving through the shadows in the foreground, which to me is, is a, a center of interest. Um, the parents have the small child in, in between them and they're walking through the shadows. They're darker against the lighter figures of the background. But I've decided to put in something that is just so typically Florentine, which is a young lady riding her Vespa through the streets. You see this everywhere. In fact, some of the Vespas can be, Vespas or small motorbikes, they can be um, overwhelming at times, almost like a swarm of bees moving through the city. But I thought this was a necessary component if I wanted to show the crowds, uh, the fe capture the feeling of the crowd that, that we experienced in Florence. So I've given her a bright red jacket. I've, I did a little research about Vespas, so I know what they look like. And I know what a person looks like when they're seated on a Vespa. So I was, I did some research uh, while I was there, some little sketches, and also uh, looked up some photos of Vespas moving through Florence. 
all this stuff plays into the the composition and the and the overall feeling of the scene and it's starting to come to life here's the the finished piece and you can see how those big graded washes have dried you can see how the darker figures in the foreground are, are kind of capturing our attention there's a fellow coming in from the right hand side that i've left blurry and not described to give him a more animated quality and i feel pleased that this captured the the feeling of a crowd in florence